So in this video, we'll be looking at a really important pattern in game programming, and that is going to be the state stack machine. Now, this pattern is basically an extension to the finite state machine pattern. So just make sure you know what a state machine is before watching this video. What this pattern solves is a common issue you're going to run into with a typical state machine, and that is the fact that a state machine does not store a history of what states we've been in. So in other words, it's hard to revert back to previous states, especially if you have two states that branch into the same single state, then reverting back to either of those states could kind of be messy, and you're going to end up with a ton of unneeded conditions. A state stack machine solves that issue. I'm going to show the example I have here. So on my screen, I have like a typical turn-based battle system, and what I've done is made every step of like selecting a skill and a target a different state, and these are all going to be handled by the state stack manager. So when I select the skills button, it's going to pop up the list of skills that I have, and something you're going to notice right away is both of my states are technically active, they technically both exist, but what my state stack manager has done, and I can actually show this in the remote tab, is I have my action select state, which was my first state. It's basically appended my next state onto the stack. The stack is kind of backwards, so the lowest down nodes are going to be on top of the stack. Whatever is on top of the stack is going to be the only like active state. So it's the only one that I can actually interact with. And then if I click one of these skills, like actually select it, it's going to pop up another state which is adding it to my stack of states and this is going to be my select targets state which in a real game you'd be able to arrow through the targets and then click confirm on the skill that you've selected and once i do this it's going to pop all of my states and revert back to the initial state so just that one state is now active so that brings us back to the first question, why am I using this over a regular state machine? One, I have visual continuity. So by adding the states as a stack, it's basically retaining the visuals. So you have like your previous menu options, which I think looks good. And it's kind of standard for video games. But one of the bigger reasons is my confirm panel or my confirm state might be applicable to multiple different branches. So let's say I have an item that I can use on an enemy. If I clicked on my items panel, I'd want it to pop up a list of the items that I have. From there, I'd also want to select an item and pop up the select targets panel with that with that confirm button, which is the same state I'm using for my skills branch. So two separate branches going to the same state, and that's not really a big deal until you try to go backwards. So with a regular state machine, I'd basically have to say, all right, when the confirm panel is created, we have to figure out which branch we're on. And then when we click out of the confirm panel, I have to switch to either this state or this state, depending on which branch we entered it on. And that's obviously kind of messy and pretty unneeded. So by using a state stack, instead of retaining which state I was previously in, it's already stored in the scene tree. So I can literally just click out, it pops the select target state and I'm back in the previous state, which would be either select skill or select item. So it has its use cases. Obviously, you're not going to use this in place of a state machine, but there are definitely some areas like this uh, battle system, for example, where you'd want to use a state stack manager. So let's get into the code, how it's actually set up. So I have two main scripts. We're going to look at both of them. I'm going to explain all the code so you don't have to worry about that. But we're looking at the state first. So basically, I've made a state class. In my case, since I'm working with UI, this is going to be extending from a control node. In my base state class, I haven't done much other than provide every state with these signals that it might need. So I have a signal for pushing the state. This is basically signaling up to to the state stack manager that it needs to add a new state to the stack. And then same thing for pop state, you basically just signal up, state stack manager is gonna pop or remove the topmost state. And then I also did this signal, which is resetting to the first state. You technically don't need this. In my use case, I found this was helpful because I can just like, when the confirm button is pressed, go all the way back to the start of my stack but this is obviously a bit more situational. So that's all you need for your state class. I have added this extra little Boolean, so I can basically say if I want this state to pop itself when you click it, um, and this is being connected to the input event, so whenever we click on the main UI element of the state, it's gonna pop itself. If I click anywhere in the background, like where there isn't an extra control node, the event is going to be caught by this parent node, which is the state, and that's basically gonna pop itself. So it just makes like the going back to the previous menu a bit easier. I don't have to code it for each state, which is nice. But yeah, back in the state script, this is really all you need. It's just these two signals 
and then you can start inheriting from this class and defining the states later, which we're going to look at in a second. But the bulk of the code is going to be in the state stack manager. So this one is also inheriting from control. So before we get into the functions down here, I want to look first at the enum values. So in state machines, there's a common problem you're going to run into. It's like, how would you actually switch to a specific state for smaller state machines that aren't going to be reused? Like for this example, I'd recommend using an enum. Basically, I'm giving every state an enum value, and then I'm referring to the state I want to switch to with this enum value. That way I'm not typing just random strings everywhere, which obviously using a string isn't great. Now that being said, if you are using this in multiple different scenes or objects, you probably don't want a massive enum to reference all of your different states. So you might want to look into using strings or some other structure, but just wanted to mention that. How I'm using it here though is I have a dictionary where I store all of my states. These are literally just loading in the direct scenes. So all of my states, kind of like what I showed before, are their own scenes. So I have my actions, select state scene. Uh, this has the buttons down here. I have one for selecting skills. This is all the buttons in there. And this one as well, which they're all just different states. And like I said, I'm loading them into this state's dictionary. So past the variables at the top, we have one more, which is just assigning the initial state that we want to switch into. And I'm making this a export for the enum. This is just so I can select it in my actual scene tree here. So I'm selecting, I want to start in the action select state. You can obviously handle this different if you're using strings or whatnot. But we have these two functions right here that I want to focus on. So the first function is pushing a state. Now this is typically going to be connected to the push state signal of each state. So basically whenever we push a state, we want to create a new instance, which it's getting the state key from our dictionary and instantiating that file, which is obviously preloaded in at the top already. And then we're making sure to, whenever we create a new state, I'm connecting to its push state, pop state, and reset to first state signals. If you have more signals in the state class, you would obviously want to connect to those, but I'm just using the three for now. And then we're actually adding the state as a child into our scene tree. And that's really it. That's all you need to do for pushing a new state. Literally just instantiate it, chuck it in the scene tree, make sure it's connected and you're good. Now the second big function is the pop state function, which also super simple. It's just getting the topmost state, which is the one that was most recently added and all it's doing is freeing it. Now, something I want to mention quick, typical finite state machines have the enter exit process physics process functions. And you can do that with this state stack manager. I wasn't going to go over that in this video just because they're not super applicable to my UI setup here. But if you do need like the enter and exit functions instead of just what I'm doing, which is using the ready function, I would definitely recommend using those just like a typical state machine. But aside from that, we're just making sure to push the initial state when we're ready. And then the other two functions are kind of just helper functions. So reset to the first state just loops through all of the children except for the first one backwards and queue freeze them. And then we just have the helper function to get the topmost state, which is just going to return get child at negative one, which obviously gets the most recently a child. So that's really it for the two parts. You have your state stack machine and you have your state class. So how would I actually add a new state, right? Let's say I wanted to add the item state and I could actually probably just duplicate the skill select state, rename it quick, potion, large, potion, uh, magic, crystal. And then I'll just move the V-Box uh, maybe like up here. This is going to look bad, but whatever. So now going into the script for the scene, you can see it's using my skill select script and I'm actually just gonna override this. So let's detach the script, extend this, and I'm gonna make a new script, call it item select state. And this is what you're gonna have when you make a new state. So basically what I'm gonna do is whenever any of the items is pressed, I want to push the select targets state so that we can select who we want to use the item on. And the way I'm going to do that is just with an export variable for the V box. That way I can just select all of my buttons. I can say for child in V box dot get children child dot pressed dot connect. We're going to connect it to on item button pressed. I'll make that function down here. If you remember, we have that signal built into the state class. So I can say push state dot emit. The argument is on the state stack machine class dot states dot target select and that's going to just work so the last thing is actually entering this item select state and we're going to do that from the action state so if i switch to my action state i've already connected my skills button to switch to the skill select state i need to do the same for the item button so going into the script for this one i'm just going to duplicate this line and instead of skill button we'll call it item button we're going to connect it the same way so item button dot press dot connect to on item button pressed make the function down here and we obviously just want to push to 
the item select state. So we're gonna say push state. Again, this is a signal we have in the state class. So we're gonna emit this and we're gonna emit it with the state we wanna switch to, which is on the state stack machine dot states. And then we don't actually have the state enum entry for this state yet. So I have to do that quick. If I go to my state stack machine, go to my enum, I'm gonna make a new entry. This is basically a new state. So I was calling this item select, and then I have to give it a scene that we load in for this state. So if I go to my item select scene, copy the UID. Yeah, we're literally just gonna add this as a value right here. So now we have a scene for the item select and going back into my action select state, whenever I click the item button, it's gonna push to the item select state. So trying this out, if I run the game, we now have two different branches that result in the same select target state. So we can go from skills, select a skill to select targets. And we can also go from the item, select an item, and it goes to select targets. So the menu flow works exactly how we want. And in addition to that, we are not duplicating any code and we're not adding extra conditions or memory to each of our specific states. So that's it for this example. Now I have linked some resources in the description. I do want to mention that this was actually heavily inspired by this book. So game programming patterns, I actually got the physical copy but you can read the entire thing for free online. So I'll make sure to link that in the description. There's a really brief section that covers the pattern that I showed you guys today, but I kind of just wanted to go more in depth, give you guys a Godot example with code so that you guys could get started using that pattern because I think it's super powerful. Aside from that though, I wanted to give a special thanks to all of the current channel members. You guys are awesome and I appreciate your support a ton. If you do want to become a channel member and help support the channel, the link is in the description as well. And then I also offer one-on-one -on -one Godot tutoring. So if you're struggling in game development or think you could learn something from me, I have a link, it'll take you to my website and you can either reach out or book a tutoring session directly through there. And if you want to get connected with the community, you can join my Discord channel, which is also linked in the description and just get help or chat with other game devs or share your progress. Anyways though, thanks for watching the video. As always, I hope you have a great week and I will see you in the next one.